So welcome. Uh, let me begin with the, the usual notice. This is a, an informal gathering. Our session is being recorded, but it will only be broadcast later. So if you do not wish to be recorded, please do switch off cameras and uh, microphones. I believe this is our 11th talk as part of the series on the living memory of cities, which been, we, we've been organising with uh, London Met. As you know, alongside this series once a month, there's also an advanced study seminar on sacred space entitled Presence, Person, Beauty. And that's something we've been organising with, with Father Peter Newby of St Mary's University. Our next session will be on the 14th of December. That will be a session with Professor Simon Goldhill, who shall be talking to us about epiphany and disruption. So that's uh, Tuesday next week, and, and all are welcome. Uh, today we have with us artist uh, Ruth Bles Luxemburg, who will be speaking on a public uh, artwork in live and near the Moselle. Uh, and I'm hoping also uh, other work and publications. Uh, the Lesson of the Vine is the title of, of uh, the talk. The proceedings will be very simple. Eric will be chairing the session. Uh, Ruth will do her keynote uh, presentation for about maybe 30 minutes or so in all freedom. And this will then be followed by a similar period of four questions. So perhaps from London Met, uh, Nick Temple or Matthew Barrick, uh, would like to start us off, but that's uh, only a, a suggestion. Meanwhile, a note to thank uh, Joanne Gold and Charlie McIntyre, who have been assisting with these sessions at Eric Perry Architects, and our graphics team in particular, Russell Watson and Roma McCook, who have been updating these events on our website and events program, and that's all. Uh, and I will now give the, the floor to uh, Matthew, um, if you're ready. Over to you, Matthew. Thank you very much. Um, just a very brief word from me to say welcome to those of you who are coming to the, the last in this year's Living Memory of Cities series. As Jose said next week, uh, there is a lecture in the parallel strand, Person, Presence, Beauty, which we're looking forward to as well. Um, uh, again, we are looking to kick off with uh, Gabrielle Bryant on the 19th of January next year. So uh, please do check um, all diarised dates on the listings on the London Metropolitan uh, University website for the Centre of Urban and Built Ecologies. Um, and just to say again that we're really uh, thrilled to be continuing this collaboration with Eric Parry Architects and particularly with Jose um, and looking forward to uh, other fruitful dimensions of it, including uh, a conference that we're currently in the planning stages of um, sometime in uh, 2022, late 2022 or early 2023. Thanks very much. That's all from me and over to Eric. Thank you, uh, Matthew. Yeah, just to, to say really as, as a principally practicing architect, uh, I have to say that the, uh, the greatest pleasure in, uh, in, in what we struggle to achieve uh, is often the collaboration with, uh, with artists and art, uh, artistic practice. Um, in that I've always believed that uh, an artist is able to take the journey much farther than we are um, in uh, in the world that perhaps begins with the the pavement, um, and it's uh, it's it's in a way the freedom from uh, perhaps uh, not pragmatics but program that uh, that allows uh, when the dialogue is good something fantastic alchemical that uh, that emerges from such dialogue. So it's a huge thrill. Uh, I mean that most sincerely that Ruth is going to talk to us about artistic research um, and uh, and all that that means and, and doesn't mean, which I'm sure she will refer to. Uh, but I, I think personally, uh, you know, in in our passings occasionally in London, in a park or a street or a exhibition. Um, it's always a huge delight and it brings me to think about her work, um, which seems to me to deal uh, in a very particular way with the dichotomy between the accessibility, if you will, of public art and, uh, and perhaps 
you know, the deeply contemplative of a more personal or private art, if I can put it that way, um, which I'm sure through uh, her explanation and uh, and talk tonight, we'll, we'll get closer to. So Root, you know, huge pleasure. Thank you for being with us. And I look forward to helping to facilitate questions at the end of your talk. So Thank over you. to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Josie, and thank you for inviting me and for making this series of talks possible. And thank you, Eric, for your beautiful introduction. And I like especially that you mentioned the word freedom in relation to artists. Um, today I will talk about Caliban Towers to start with, which is in a way a prologue. And as the series is um, interrogating the memory of cities, I thought I'd start with my own memory of the city, which is Caliban Towers, a work I made in the 90s. And it was a public artwork commissioned by um, MAF Architects, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. The first slide, please. Next. OK, thank you. I will ask uh, for the slides to be moved as I can't do it myself. So um, I want to read you a short text I wrote about Caliban Towers with Caspar Ebenskart before the Urban Night Project. And in that Urban Night Project, we look especially at light and the city and what it means today. Um, Caliban Towers, Hackney Council, a council in London, for those who are not um, know the London scene. Hackney Council had an inspired phase in the 1960s of naming their social housing estates and towers after Shakespearean characters. Situating the present moment in history, making the historical present. While the recent naming of residential high-rise buildings is meant to engender the aspirational economies associated with height, conquest and ascent, the pinnacle, principal tower, altitude or the halo, the ambitious period of welfare expansion in the UK drew on the high culture through the characters from Shakespeare's comedies and tragedies. But this seemingly innocent practice had an unsettling charge when a building was named after a complex fictional villain such as Caliban. For the 14th story tower, forming part of the Arden Estate in Hackney, East London, the council choose Caliban. The rebellious and monstrous, in inverted commas, inhabitant of a far off island in the tempest. With Prospero, a prototype colonizer, arriving on the island, Caliban was forced into slavery, accused of rape and tortured with dark, harmful magic. Caliban is an anagram of the Spanish word cannibal, used derogatively to characterize Carib people during settler colonial times. Shakespeare's Caliban was mortified when he saw his own reflection in a puddle. Next slide, please. Uh, next. In the 1990s, Caliban Tower was surrounded by barbed wire and prominent security cameras, which imposed on the wider estate a panoptical system of control and observation. In my work, Caliban Towers, the curtain of golden leaves sets the towers on a stage and asks questions about naming, the naming of buildings, but also the naming of artworks. Next. This is how the work was installed uh, near the estate in close proximity to where the photographs were taken. And it was a public billboard done very uh, economically and put up there where it lasted a year. So the local inhabitants could see a different representation of their estate, of their home and illuminated especially for, the artwork was illuminated especially, that's something that Muff sorted out, and thereby it gave the, the city dwellers another view on, on their estate. 
Okay, so that's my uh, little prologue. And now I want to move into the lesson of the vine, which is more recent public artwork. And this one is permanent. Next, please. Next, okay, next. Okay, and next, please. Next. Okay, the lesson of the vine um, happened because I made a work before with Lynch Architects in Victoria, Westminster, in London again, for Westminster City Council. Silver Forest used um, the technique of cast concrete and I showed in this work an urban forest, which I had created out of photographic fragments I made in Beijing, but also in London. I focused on the silver birch tree, but what was important for this work is that it's not an ornamental forest, which you then could put up in a, um, in a uh, airport lounge as an ornamental pleasant work, but this is an urban forest and it shows signs of the pollution, which is apparent in these trees. But it also shows something else. In this case, I don't know if you quite see it, this uh, man is standing in front of a sandbag. But a sandbag which for some reason was placed in this forest and thereby introduces the possibility of, uh, of a metaphor. What does this sandbag actually mean? Why is it there? And in my thinking, this sandbag uh, hovers between a potential gift, but it could also allude to a scene of a crime. It could be something much darker. Next one. Next. Ah. Okay, so um, after Brexit, I got a call from the mayor of this village, which you see here on the Moselle River. And the mayor, who curiously is called Hermes, like the sort of Götterbote, the sort of delivery, the messenger of uh, God's messenger, Hermes, called me and asked me to make an artwork for his village. He had seen in the German press representations of the Silver Forest, and so he felt confident and curious to invite me to make an artwork for his village. He had recently commissioned a local architect called Chu Weyer to uh, design a community forum for the village. Next one. Yeah, so these are the uh, basic renderings and uh, I went over there, I met the mayor, I met the architects and they already were very far developed within the project and then asked me how, how I could imagine contributing to their design. And uh, the community forum is basically that, it's there for the community to hold their meetings, to have their wine tastings, to have their annual celebrations, to have their theatre plays, to provide a canteen for local ch school children to eat. But they also had classrooms designed for the refugees, which at the time were had been uh, allowed to come into Germany, as you will remember, Merkel was uh, had a, the, uh, Germany had a, uh, uh, an open border policy for the refugees. So I was very touched and struck, especially in light of the recent Brexit vote in Britain, how the Germans were thinking in their design about creating an infrastructure that would um, manifest the Willkommenskultur, that they were thinking through in design and architecture how to make that possible for the newcomers to these places and how this was sought through even on a local micro level of a village of 2000 inhabitants. And that very much informed my thinking about the artwork because whatever artwork I will now add to their building has to speak to all these different constituencies. It has to speak to the local community, but it also has to speak to the guests as a, as a village which is a has tourism, which relies on visitors, it has to speak to the guests, 
but it also has to speak to the new future inhabitants. It has to announce to them, this is the place where you find yourself, and this is the sort of core, the beating heart of this community. So I did something which in a way is very obvious. I looked at the, the um, economic culture of the, the village, which is the wine, the wine growing. That is something that has been done there since Roman times, so it's of historical importance, but it's also their main cultural and economic product. So it was clear that the wine had to be part of this work. And I thought about the wine not just as an ornamental um, creation on the, for the building, but the wine as a tool to talk about a lesson. What can the vine plant teach the locals, the visitors, but also the newcomers? Next one, please. Oh no, let's stay. Um, sorry, can we go back? Sorry. Yeah, so as you can see here, this is the, this is the building and um, I noticed the three wooden columns, the three wooden pillars. And for them, for me, it became clear that those structures already in place would be ideal for me to, um, to use and to re recast by using the vine. So I used what already was there and added my own take on it. Next one. Yeah, so here you see the, the, the vine harvest and um, the vine harvest is also the time when um, a, a large community of Romanian uh, helpers comes and spends six weeks within the area and helps to harvest the vine. So that's another constituency who I wanted to um, make the work for. Next one. Please. Okay, that's me photographing the vine plant. Now, in a way, you might think that's, you know, it's, it was an easy, um, it wasn't too complex, but at the same time, behind me, you see all these vines. And how do you find amongst the millions of vines the one which is the one to be? chosen. Next one. Okay, and here we have one. So I chose a vine plant which was in its full Baroque um, exuberance in the just before the harvest with lots of many ripe grapes on it. And next one. And I then went back in the winter and photographed the same vine again. And as you can see here, my technique was kind of simple. I use a large format camera, I use film and a tripod, and I put a blanket behind the vine to single it out. So I used very much the early historical um, techniques of, pho of photography. Next one. And there you see it again. So um, putting a sheet up made uh, the backdrop and made it possible to single out the one plant. Next one. Okay, and here you see me doing it. And I was interested in this particular vine because as you can see, it curls around the support structure, the pole. So it talked for me there's a metaphor, metaphor here about how the vine, this living thing, is being supported by, um, by an infrastructure. And that is something I also wanted to say by putting the work onto the columns, because the columns support the building. Again, they support the building as a, as a metaphor how the community is supported by their building and they can all find a home or a dwelling within it. 
So the importance of support for something seemed crucial to make visible in the work. Next one. OK, this is the same one in in the winter. And next one. OK, now we're moving quickly forward. So this is the building when it was being constructed. And there's something quite sad about this kind of construction pictures in their in-between stage. But uh, it's also a moment when, you know, when things come together and when uh, possibility happens. Next one. And here we have the, the local handwerker, the craftsman in their special German gear, putting up the work. Next one, please. OK. The big reveal. I should say something about the location of that village. It's on the Moselle River, and the river is really what connects this place to other places across the border. So it is very uh, live and is very close to France and Luxembourg. In fact, it's very close to Schengen and the local people sort of um, identify themselves via the river. They share uh, even a, a sort of dialect which is spoken across the borders. So I wanted to also um, um, make that connection to the, to the places across the border who also very much um, contribute to viniculture, which is the shared culture of these three border regions, the share wine culture. So this is something that um, was important to me. And here you see the local wine queen unveiling the work. Next one. Um, in these uh, rural regions, it's of course important to have a uh, get together, to have a conviviality and uh, to mark a moment like the unveiling of a, of a new building and the unveiling of an artwork. It is a, a fest, a fest a local fest, and it is also marked by the local dignitaries who all come and give speeches, and the local priest you see here blessing the building and blessing the work. Next one. And also the local um, Männergesangsverein comes and entertains the guests with their music. So I included these images to show how an artwork is has to be sort of accepted by the local community, has to be celebrated by the local community to, um, to pulsate. Next one. And that's me with uh, Herr Hermes, the, the mayor, and the uh, local politician Frau Horsch, whose uh, local government paid for the work. Next one. What I noticed at the opening was that um, everyone seemed very keen to touch the work. And as we know, you normally don't touch a photograph, but as this is a cast photograph, it, it invites touch. And we do say seeing is believing, but maybe for these, uh, this community, which mainly consists of wine growers, touching is believing. They had a real uh, physical haptic desire to, to touch the artwork. Next one. Next one. Yeah, so and I think this I was very intrigued by that. And I think that element of touching being al being allowed to touch an artwork 
for them was also claiming it as their own. At the same time, I sensed a certain skepticism and only by, through touching the work, they could um, perhaps put their skepticism aside. Or maybe the touch is part of a critical, skeptical uh, analysis of the work. Next one. Here you get also the sense of the scale. So I scaled up the vine, so it towered over the, the human scale, and it also fitted the column, and thereby the column character of the vine was um, amplified. Next one. Okay, more, more touching, more... Um, sensual, skeptical touching taking place. And next one, please. Okay, so here you see it now. The building was uh, using the local slate. And the slate is very important in the region because it's what lets the vine, um, wine production be possible because the slate stone keeps the heat during the day. And so on colder nights, it reflects back the heat and thereby allows for wine growing to take place. And it's used uh, in, in many of the houses. And so the architects use the local vernacular of the slate. Here you see the winter vine next to the summer vine. And that brings me back to what is actually my lesson of the vine. Because the, um, the year-long skills of nurture, care and discipline enable the cyclical transformation of the vine plant to vine the drink. So we go from work to pleasure, we go from nature to culture. And I think um, this juxtaposition of winter and autumn makes that clear. So I, so I use the vine as a, as a metaphor in that way. So to come back to the, um, to the visitor or the new inhabitants of the village, they understand that the community functions because they put in the work to get from the winter vine to the summer vine. And also, um, I'm not sure if you can see it on this um, slide, it is uh, very much about pruning, cutting, um, binding. So the, the jobs are visible within this juxtaposition. Next one, please. Yeah, that's how it looks at night. And the next one. And for the front of the building, I chose the vine, which is intertwined with its pole to uh, emphasize, again, the, the notion of a support structure. How a building is a support structure but also how the divine needs a support structure to function. And next one. Uh, here you see the local children having their midday meal in the building. The um, beauty of this material of casting a photograph in concrete is that it um, can withstand the weather and that it can become really part of the architecture. So it is an ornament, but at the same time, it is part of the facade. It's not structural, but it can exist in the um, outdoor elements, which um, I think is important. Also, how does one, um, for me as a, who works with photography, it is a difficult question how to put a photograph in the public sphere, which is not tr tried or which over a period of time still holds its own. 
So through using this gray cast concrete, it sort of blends in. It's not too domineering. It, it's not something that um, demands too much attention from the viewer, but it becomes part of the general atmosphere. Next one. That's at night. And next one. Next one, yeah, okay. Now, um, after I made the work, I uh, understood, because it's a rural context and the people who happen to be there will see it, but uh, I sensed it was important for the work to exist also in a different form and to bring in other voices, not just my interpretation or my voice, but I wanted uh, other people, I wanted the wine growers, I wanted writers and poets to tell me what for them the lesson of the vine was. So I decided to make a publication which would complete the project. So the publication is as much part of the actual artwork as the artwork itself. Next one. So I asked uh, uh, the, the contributors, what is the lesson of the vine? I asked artists, writers and wine growers the question and their responses, reflections and songs are gathered together in a publication. Textual images are roused and conjured up, such as the insatiable mouth of the vine louse, devouring the language of the vine, or the surge and flow of the vine trilloquist, ventriloquist, vine trilloquist, speaking in intoxicated tongues, nocturnal fires in the vineyards, gardens of paradise and gardens of errors. The vines become memory, idea and proposal, a fertile living construct that connects speech and image, idea, thought and generosity. So, um, and I sh wanted to show you how I designed the book and how I made the book. So maybe we go to the next image. Uh, I worked very closely with a London publisher called Everyday Press, Arnaud Desjardins, and I used fragments of the samples the company who had produced the panels made as pages within the book and juxtapose them with texts by the contributors. Next one, please. So maybe I give you a little flavor of the texts. So this one is the vine trilloque, which is a sort of word play on the ventriloquist. Uh, and it's written by Douglas Park, a poet. My idea was to bring in trusted interlocutors to contribute, people who I had been in dialogue and discourse with over the many years of my practice, people who I had an, a sort of, who I had, a, um, who had an affinity with my work and who I also had an affinity with their work. So Douglas Park wrote about what for him is the lesson of the vine and the wine. <laughs> driving fuel and lifesaver medicine, floral blossoming and sunlight, perfume and breath, speech and action, breeze and tidal wave, traveling straight through unbroken, otherwise impenetrable, obstructive solidity, bound towards arrival at great outdoors exposure. Next, mystery superpowers escape, ever after more mutual adventure, newfound exchange. Um, that's Douglas's contribution. I translated it in uh, German, so the publication was English and German. And I also asked local wine growers to tell me what for them was the lesson of the vine. Next one, please. So this female vine grower, Annette Köverich, wrote, vines 
are female in the German language. The Lianas willingly adopt the forms of education in um, offered coiling around wire frames and single poles, and on sunny early summer mornings fling themselves skywards, as though there was something to hold on there. And while we educate them according to the rule book, in the belief that we are taming them, we must abide by their rhythm, we must cut bind and cultivate them so that their juices may produce special vines during centuries of having wrested the paradisical potion from the steep slopes vines have been teaching us and um, yeah i like that very much that she highlighted how we actually are educated by nature how nature has been our great teacher next one Um, I also asked the uh, novelist Tom McCarthy, and he wrote a very short haiku, Leaf, leaf marks. Leaves leave marks too, sometimes. Outlines on the tarmac, their own skeletons. Like photos, or Hiroshima, when they fall. So the responses were very varied. Um, next one, please. And also quite propositional. And maybe uh, I will read you an excerpt of this one to show you the, the propositional nature of the texts. This is the garden designer song. We are gardeners of ourselves and every other. We cling to each other with error after error, a garden of hungers, harvesting errors of faith in the future, hurtling around the sun. In the garden, the garden designer seek new dynamos of error emancipation. It is always asking itself what it can build to bring aliveness into contact with experience, how to amplify the care with which error is harvested into the currency of traction. This is by Hilary Krupsassen. So what I was very keen on is that I didn't want people to write about my work or provide a commentary or a, a sort of conventional critique. I wanted the contributors to make their own work in response to my work, just as I had tried to make my work in response to the architect. Okay, and um, next one. And next, oh yeah. and next one. This is a beautiful one. So that's the last excerpt I'm going to read. And it's by Ellen Mara de Vesta, a curator. The fullness of time. The lesson of the vine is do it now. Do it now because later the juice will be gone. The bus will be flat. Time will leave behind a wrinkled skin and shrunken body. But also the vine teaches that those skins will be sweet. It shows how old lessons are fast forgotten. Reality is refreshed with new sap. All is forgiven and things begin anew. The lesson turns like the seasons. The dam breaks and gathered momentum rushes in, refueling those shriveled bags and restoring their taut curves. And yeah, next one, please. The book was then launched in London and similar to the, um, the work, which people enjoy touching, it seemed to be important to have a physical object because there is something about the physical touch of a book, about the materiality of a book that I think is very, very important. And the other aspect is a book can um, have a distribution system that goes maybe under the radar. Not all is visible who will have the book. Like online, we know, you know, everyone can see what we're doing. But I think a book gives us more freedom to put in things which are perhaps um, more difficult or uh, um, 
less, less obvious. So the materiality and the ability to bring different things into a book seemed crucial. OK, next one. And next one. And the next one. OK, now um, I'm moving into the epilogue. And we started in London, we started in Hoxton with Caliban Towers, and I will finish in Hoxton. Next, next slide. With a work called Urban Harvest. This is a snapshot I took in my neighborhood. And as you see, there's a vine on a, on a building next to an off license. And next one. And this is the work I made about it. I returned and I returned in the winter. And as you can see, the, the vines have withered on the, or the, the grapes have withered on the vine. It hasn't been harvested. It hasn't been pruned. It hasn't been cut. So maybe the lesson hasn't been um, learned or for whatever reason, it didn't quite happen. And also uh, in this urban context, we have the, the sort of accoutrements of the, the, the of satellite communication, of of um, the, the uh, light box, you know, of all the urban paraphernalia, and nature seems to be um, it's still there, it's still growing the grapes, but somehow needs attention, and that's what I wanted to bring forward in this work, urban harvest. This is just one slide from the series. It, um, and it has happened since we've become so much more um, thoughtful about the relationship of nature and the city. And I showed this work, next slide. I showed this work in Pier Gallery, which is in Hoxton, on Hoxton Street. I made it into a large indoor billboard and I used some of the fragments of the text by Douglas Park, the, the ventriloquists, to put it into context and to make the connection. And I also, maybe you would see on the, on the work, I put one of the fragments of the work from Germany. So I tried to create an adjacency and um, perhaps a sort of proposal of um, different vine wine sinking, wine growing technologies. So um, thank you so much audience for listening to me and I hope it gave you an insight of how I was thinking about making a public artwork and um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. So thank you. Yeah. That's uh, that's great. That just drew one in deeply. It's wonderful. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, congratulations. There are applause, virtual applause, all over the place. So that's that's for sure. Um, before we, yeah, let's see where the questions might open. I'm looking for a raised hand. Um, uh, maybe Nicholas, Matthew, you could uh, start us off, or Dagmar. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Nicholas. Yeah, please. First, and Dagmar. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your your lecture. I really enjoyed it. Um, by the way, I, I live in Hoxton, so um, it's quite nice to see uh, a, a, a very sensitive kind of intervention actually happening uh, in this part of London. I've got a I've got an observation, really. I mean, the, the, the issue of the lesson of the vine, the thing that struck me as particularly interesting is the idea that the vine teaches us the value of time. And it recalls two very, very different books um, on the subject of, of time and also orality and, and the written word. The one, the first one is by Zygmunt Bauman, who wrote a book, which I recently finished actually, called Liquid Time. And his his position, Zygmunt Bauman, you may know, is an eminent sociologist. Um, but he he basically argues that we're in a we're in an age of radical transition between what he describes as concrete time 
into its liquid liquidification and the time is precipitous and we're unable to kind of get a sense of even making decisions or having moments of thought and reflection uh, because time in a way is kind of slipping past us. So this kind of velocity of time, its rapidity. And in a way, what you've presented here is this idea of the vine is a perfect kind of metaphor of this, this thing of holding back, of reflection. And it, it reminds me of a, of a, a text which is of, of also equal significance, probably greater significance, and that's in the vineyard of the text by um, Ivan Illich, which is a, a text on the Didascalicon by Hugh of St. Victor, which actually is, is an exploration of the trace, the transition from the vocal into the written word <clears throat> in the Middle Ages. And the way in which you've articulated this one work, where you have the relationship between concrete and the photograph, um, to me is a kind of interesting comparison to how we actually understand this issue of temporality through our forms of communication, essentially, whether it's the visual, whether it's this idea of the, the spoken word. I was particularly taken by the way in which the, the project itself becomes a catalyst for a whole series of events, um, whether it's the book, whether it's the poet, you know, reciting from the book, whether it's performers outside rejoicing, and you use the word pulsating, um, and the tactile nature of the material. Um, and of course, it's it's kind of architectural. And in a sense, the ambiguity of the of, of these installations, you say that they're neither structural nor really ornamental, but they but they have a certain kind of structural integrity because of the nature of the material and their tactile nature. So I think in, in a way, it's, it's a kind of interesting exploration of all these different strands. But I think it says a great deal about the contemporary condition of, uh, of, tempor of, of, of time, essentially, and what the vine tells us as a, as, a, as a way of, in a sense, of teaching us about reflection and the slowness of time through seasons, through discourse, through interaction, you know, and I think it's a, it's a lovely, lovely example. That was just an observation. Yes, thank you, thank Definitely. you very much. And I think the idea of liquid time is quite well um, shown in the, the work I showed you last in London, where we have all these other elements which cause the hyper velocity of our time, like the uh, satellite dish and all the nocturnal illumination, extreme illumination. So, yeah. And um, the, the rural is a kind of um, interesting challenge, I think, for for artists and architects, because on one level, we, we sort of think we are, you know, discourse wise, we are so we already are in the next chapter and they are still within another time zone. And so um, that that was also for me interesting to bring together and therefore also have the voices of the, the locals within the book, bring them, introduce them to merge the, the, the rural and the urban and hence the, the publication. But also, of course, when we think about time, it's how we fill the time, isn't it? So how do we fill the time between the dark winter and uh, the, the autumn is um, um, a question. And that's, you know, um, hence, um, and I don't think it's a Protestant thing to, to show the sort of work that goes from um, the winter to the, the harvest, but uh, it's um, it is a it's an interesting yeah it's an interesting lesson nevertheless and the, the discipline it takes to actually get up at six in the morning and sort of prune those those vines in the in the winter. Mm. Thank you, Dagmar. Where will you take us? Hello. hello. Um, very enjoyable talk. Um, I was very interested in the way, well, in the context of this this series, you know, uh, drawing meaning from the context of a project um, is very important. And um, I thought you did that really beautifully. So in my experience, both with 
um, architectural projects, but also in architectural education, that very often projects are invented on the basis of, you know, the architects or the tutors, some personal preoccupation, and that is then superimposed onto any city. Um, and the project is generated in that way, whereas your work is so sensitively based on the context and on the local culture that I think that's that's a really interesting um, lesson, both for artists and for architects. But one thing that I wanted to ask you about, so to me, when you started showing pictures of the vine, I immediately had, you know, kind of Christian connotations came to mind. I was surprised that people didn't mention that. Um, in the context of southern Germany, I imagine that must be quite strong. And, um, uh, you know, you can see it in, in most churches, the vine represented somehow as, um, as a very good thing. But I wondered, in the current kind of woke culture, where you're not supposed to do anything that offends or excludes anyone, whether there was ever any um, kind of concern amongst your uh, audience that this might be a little bit too Christian for, <laughs> for uh, you mentioned newcomers and so on, and people who might not be uh, familiar with that particular um, cultural theme. But um, as you know, the vine uh, belongs to many cultures, not just uh, the yeah, Roman. Particular to the Greco-Roman and European yes. culture since then. Mm -hmm. Yes, but also, um, I mean, there's wine in Syria, and so, uh, importantly so, and um, many of the refugees were from that part of the world. So I think the wine also, it is, in a sense, it's a, it's a metaphor that many people can appreciate. And yes, there, there is a Christian um, a dimension to it, and also the way it is this this on the column, this large vertical um, work, uh, it evokes the, the cross for sure. Um, and maybe that's why everyone needed to touch it, you know, maybe mm -hmm. that was part of that religious um, um, southern German background that they needed, needed to have the, 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 needed to touch it to see if it is real. <laughs> So, um, yeah, but I think that is the beauty of art, that it is actually quite um, ambivalent, it's ambiguous, it's open, and it allows for many different entry points. So if, if one gets this Christian narrative that is perhaps uh, strengthen it, but if others don't get it, it doesn't really matter. But it is very universal, I agree. So the idea of spiritual sustenance which you get from grapes and from wine, yeah, from wine is pretty universal. And also the Bacchanalian elements, we must not yes. forget. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Dagmar. Matthew, please. Uh, hi, yeah, thank you so much, um, Ruth, uh, for this. Um, I think um, I, I, I uh, I was reflecting. Uh, firstly, I just enjoyed very much the uh, the kind of nuance of the way you spoke about the um, uh, the, the the idea of cultivation, uh, quite literally, uh, in relation to these the, these questions of culture, especially as you contextualized it, um, the migrant uh, issue with regard to German German policy. And the idea, I think you called it a, a willkommen culture, which is a word I've never he heard, but uh, fantastically, um, um, yeah, very, very lucid word. Um, and the idea that people need to take the time, firstly, understand uh, what hosting might mean in this context, and also take the time to get to know people. So those comments that Nick made about time in relation to the steam of the vine were also very interesting. But um, but 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 really, my mind was turning, especially around this theme of culture and cultivation, to um, the, the the kind of traditional, if you like, function of ornament um, in certainly in architectural history and theory with regard to ideas of mediation. Now, you used the word ornament twice, as I remember, in quite different ways. When you were talking first, you said, "My forest is not like one of those ornamental forests you get in an airport." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, but then later on, you you talked about ornament having this specific 
interesting middle ground, if you like, that it is part of the building and yet not part of the building. So I was really interested in that because I, it's very rare that you would hear an artist, and maybe because you are a confident, experienced artist, talking about their work having, if you like, an ornamental function. But I thought it might be interesting to reflect for a moment on the idea of the function as of ornament as specifically not just metaphoric, but acting as, if you like, a bridge between these different dimensions of, if you like, the structure of culture and the structure of the environment that we live in, especially with regard to time, because these two, the, 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 the projects that you showed, uh, and especially the way they had different lives, like the image of Caliban Tower, and then that image placed on a, on a kind of hoarding, if you like, as a public artwork under a bridge, creating this displacement of art in a way that creates that space for reflection or displacement of the image, but also um, the work in Victoria and this work in, in Germany, people want to touch it and think about it. So it creates a moment of reflection and in this way answers to that bigger agenda of just slowing us down, which we all, if there's any function for culture that we need right now, it's to be slowed down in, this, in, in our world of liquid time to a moment of reflection uh, and kind of shared possibilities. So, uh, I, I, so that there's not a direct question in there, but if there is a question, um, it is around that idea of ornament. Um, what can uh, what can the public artwork, or if you like, the 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 work that claims the place of ornament, um, do for us with regard to our our culture today? And, um, and what can it not do? Can we expect it to do too much? Yes, uh, thank you for picking up on me using the term ornament twice in very different ways, but it's really important that we think about that. And it brings me back to what Eric, um, the term he used at the beginning, which was freedom. And so I think the role for the artist is to exercise freedom in their work and maybe introduce something that goes beyond what we would consider conventionally ornamental and maybe introduce an element which is perhaps disruptive, maybe even disturbing, or um, certainly brings up a, a wider complexity of questions. And that's why in the Silver Forest there's the sandbag, which needed to be there, and I, I obviously placed it there to introduce that. And in the in the lesson of the vine, um, there's nothing really that disrupts the work as such, but maybe to see the stark winter vine was for the locals something they didn't expect because in their uh, thinking that is something they don't celebrate as such, you know, the, the, the conventional visual image of the vine is the one in its fullness and exuberant beauty, but not the, the stark winter visualization of the vine. So I think that's perhaps where I disrupted the notion of the conventional ornament. OK, thank you. Um, Christian. Hi, yes, yeah, thanks. I also really, really enjoyed the talk and it was really nice to see the new work in light of some of the older work as well than the, the Parisian work that I remember from, from, from a while ago. And I was struck in the two two particular ones in the um in the Silver Forest one. I don't I'm not a forester, but my understanding of silver birch is that most European forests were sort of oak ash, big, big trees. And a silver birch is the trees that start first and they create the ground for the bigger trees then to grow. And so what you find within uh, the metaphor of the silver birch in, in, in that particular part of London is a sort of seedling forest, uh, an early forest of, of, of beginnings, not yet the oaks of maybe other parts of the city. I wondered if that had been a, a part of your, your, your metaphorical thinking there. And then equally with something like um, 
the lesson of the vine, I was really struck by um, the interesting population changes that happen at harvest and the festival side of that that you were talking about and the relationship that of course historically the Ville Commons Culture works extraordinarily well over a seasonal framework and always has done in those parts of Germany through the trimming and cutting and drinking of uh, of, of of wine um, and that was what was so interesting about the dead untended vine that in fact it didn't have that culture of care associated to it. It still had nature doing what nature does, but because it didn't have the work associated with it, which you might associate with an urban culture, it, it then got, it got lost. And so I was really interested at, at that point as to whether um, we're beginning to think about, I think in our school, uh, the idea of of a given climate issues and, and uh, build, 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 built ecologies is what we're we're talking about. And the fact that you link nature with with the urban culture as a part of where we need to think about going forward. And I wondered if, again if if that aspect of um Commons culture, which has always been very open, but is underpinned by the work of the trimming, as you say, there's a sort of a balance between a transitory and a very permanent culture which work together to, to 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 blossom the landscape was a part of that one so it's really a link about you know how deep how deep did the metaphors go in both of those well um i think in a way you as the viewer <laughs> continue making the metaphors and continue reading the work you know the image is uh, um is an offering in that sense, and then you can read it. The one, the urban line, which hadn't been tended, and in the English language you say, withered on the vine, you know, something that has not fulfilled its potential. So uh, it seemed really poignant in in that work. So the, the work, in a way, suggests the, the reading, those readings. But it's also, um, it's incomplete. You know, and then it's it changes. Yeah. But is, I mean, I, I suppose what I'm sort of broader thing would be to say, is your fascination with nature and urban and the way the two meet? Because that seems to me to be an under underlying theme. Yeah. It's something that's very um, present at the moment, and I think we're all aware of it, and we've all uh, we can we can sense the importance of it. And when I did the Silver Forest, which opened in uh, 2016, you know, I already was um, very much thinking about what the relationship is between the city and nature, but it is an urban forest. And that was very in Beijing and in London. And it was very crucial for me to show they do exist, but they are, especially the birch, which is a pioneer tree, they are under attack by pollution, by not thinking about how they can be best nourished. And since then, so much has changed. And I'm sure uh, the architects amongst you, it's one of your most, one of the most important criteria these days when thinking about planning space and buildings. I mean, we've, a lot has happened since. And maybe artists have a, um, a, that special superpower of tapping into premonition, of sensing what might become important in in the future. Thank you. But I wanted to, uh, Matthew, we were talking about ornament, and I've just done a, a project on Nicolas Ledoux, the Saline Royale, and of course the ornament there is very important i just want to show you quickly a print can you can you see it it's the absolutely yeah it's the yeah being sword urns yeah thank you i ju just um com coming coming back on that one i was going to just also um if, if the conversation is continuing the installation at the pierre gallery i didn't see it but it's around the corner from me and um, I think that condition of the kind of tangled garden situation that is the reality in much uh, much of our urban situation um, 
it's uh, it, it's uh, that it's a very nice little gallery space, but it is a kind of a giant vitrine, a big shop window, which then turns the corner into that memorial garden um, that was put up, uh, Khadija's Garden, it's called. Um, and I think the idea that uh, artworks can have this way of um, uh, creating these resonances between uh, something, a set of ideas that might that might be driven by someone's personal reflections, for example, your uh, your starting point for the photograph that you took with the memory of the project in Germany, and also resonate with local conditions. Those resonances and mediations really do add add value in a way that is very public. I mean, that is the streetscape. So even the resonance between inside and outside in that in that condition with those two corners working against each other, I wish I had known it was on. I would have taken a trip to, to go and see it. Can I uh, can I just butt in myself? Um, I, if there aren't other immediate questions, it, it would be um, I. You know, uh, it, there, there seems to be. I mean, there's something kind of rather magical about the generosity of fruit, and uh, you know that uh, strays beyond the vine, obviously. But there's that tradition of um, a culture of orchard trees, like apple trees, that are that are planted in, in Germany, particularly to mark the journey journeyman's uh, route, you know, um, that actually they're public and you can pick the apple rather than it being, you know, something sinful or belonging to the private domain. Um, and I, I, I don't know, there's something within, you know, the German artistic uh, kind of psyche, which strikes me as being very interesting in terms of that generosity. I'm just, I'm just thinking of yourself and Boyce and the, you know, the Ica project and, you know, and then Kiefer. I mean, could you, do you mind just placing your work into a, into a broader context for us? Mm, that's interesting. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that's really interesting. Of course, the way um, Kiefer uses landscape into trees is to deal with the trauma of German's history. And similarly, um, boys, for him, it's also a sort of healing with the felt and the fat and the Aisha, the oak trees, healing Germany's uh, trauma and uh, past. So um, I'm a generation younger than them. And um, yeah, there is, there's a curious relationship the Germans have to nature, not always um, simple, quite complex, but when it is used in a sort of, um, in a generous way, then um, I'm all for it. I can, I can be with it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that's why I frame that within the, within the idea of generosity, because there seems to be you know, a very uh, deep-rooted generosity there. Um, Kirsten, please. You are muted. Okay. Hi, Ruth. Um, thank you so much for your talk. I'm, I wonder if it's okay if I move across from a philosophical discussion or you know, um, across to, as an architect, asking you questions about, you know, I've, I've worked on projects where there have been art strategies, so the Home Office, um, and I've worked on then just last December with London Met doing ref uh, write-ups for artists like Simone Ten Hompel or, um, and then also bringing the two together, you know, that age-old adage art and architecture and the, um, the symbiosis or the interrelation or a hundred other descriptions for it. And I suppose, um, Perhaps it'd be a bit boring, but wanting to ask you about the actual process that you went through to get your art with the architecture, working with the architect, your, your inclusion in the process from the very beginning or some way through, and through then also to the actual production of those tiles, the concrete, and whether that was something, you know, how, how much you were included in that brief from beginning to end to watching them put up, because I noticed on that which is so 
for anyone with a little bit of OCD, was so pleasing to see the lineup of the top of that tile across the top of the 2.1 of the door and across the top of the window to the left. Um, I had to take a screenshot. <laughs> I enjoyed it really much, a lot. And I, I just wanted, you know, something like taking your artwork and that photograph and cutting it into two tiles. Did you have a say where you could cut it, you know, and your your um, just your involvement in the process? Um, mm. You know, one of the other things was, um, you know, Peter St. John's uh, work as well and looking as the architecture to form the backdrop for the art, which is, you know, et cetera. So could I go to that that point rather to the actual physical implementation of your work? Yes, I mean, uh, conventional wisdom would say bring in the artist from the beginning. But maybe that's not always necessary because it is um, just like the architect sort of responds to the city and to a found situation. So maybe the artist can be inspired responding to, in this case, what the architect already had planned. Okay. So it didn't, um, it didn't work against me or against the project to come in later when they already had their design. Or contraire, it sort of provided the backdrop on which I could then develop my ideas. Okay. When I did the Silver Forest, Patrick Lynch brought me in really at the beginning. And that was um, also a different process and very, very um, productive too. That was a five-year project. So um, the project evolved over time and ideas became much more um, refined over this time. Also in dialogue with the planners, with the people who produce the panels, etc. So that was for me um, uh, also a learning process, which I really appreciate. You know, when you make art or when you make architecture, whatever, it's also you learn through it, you develop its practice. And um, but in this case, it was absolutely fine to come after the fact, so to speak. And is the architecture a backdrop? Is it, is it, yeah, in a way, in this case, it is, and it is still, I am, I'm also mindful of them, and of, of their ideas in terms of the, the, the color, the, 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 the slate, the apertures within the building. Yes, uh, we worked afterwards together at at the early CGI, there were three columns. Later, there were only two because for some structural reasons or economic reasons, I can't remember. So you, you go you go with it. It's a dialogical process. Yeah, yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I th oh, sorry, Dagmar, please. If, uh, was that a question? Or disappearance. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, yes, if we have time, I just had uh, one small technical question about um, how those photographs are transferred onto precast concrete and how durable is the, the final product? I mean, does it wear off? How deep into the surface does it go? Well, there is a company in Ireland who developed this uh, method. They got a uh, patent for it. It's a very small company and Patrick Lynch introduced me to them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so uh, I work analog on film, traditional, that allows for a really good resolution in the image, which you really don't get on the digital. And thereby, um, after that, so my film is then scanned and from the scan, a mold is being made and in the mold this concrete mixture is being poured. So that's the that's the method how it's done. Not explained very technically, but <laughs> and um, yeah, so the one in uh, Westminster, it's been there since 2016, it's meant to last for um, for a few more decades. Uh, it perhaps <laughs> would even outlast the building these days. Yeah. With, with, things change in London so yeah well thank you those two last questions kind of wove together in a very nice way and I think you know um, 
Uh, beyond that, we'll actually have our, our silk screens out and our, our, our mixing pots. So I think actually we, we've kind of got to a very natural conclusion route. And I, I just want to thank you hugely. I've, I've forgotten about the world of pressure and problems um, because you, you've taken us on a wonderful journey. And I just wanted to thank you for that and, uh, uh, and look forward to uh, another meeting somewhere sometime soon. So good luck and, uh, thank and thanks to everyone. You are, are kind of, uh, I think it's a lovely, lovely uh, presentation. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thank thanks. thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you. Take care.